many ways, Dead Island 2 wants you to be a zombie. It hopes you will mindlessly crave the blood and guts of its main threat, turning your mind off for the narrative leaps and world-building excuses it has so that you can just dig into the game's bloody combat. In many ways, it aims to be the ultimate turning your mind off game. Hell, it gives you zombie powers. It wants you to be a zombie. In the best possible state, and I will not say whether or not I think it achieves that state, it is a shallow game, and there's nothing wrong with that. Not every game with the undead needs to be The Last of Us, and most just need to be fun. But most fun, shallow games don't then use that shallowness to make a point, much less a morally nuanced point. Alright, you probably think I'm crazy here. This is a video about Dead Island 2. The first person hack and slash where your main objective is, brutalize zombies, have fun, and don't think too much about it. And that is the game where I'm going to talk about moral nuance? Well, yes. Let me explain. Firstly, no, the game does not have any hidden moral choices that would be stupid. The moral nuance comes instead from the character writing. Not by writing particularly complex characters, in fact the characters here are vapid Hollywood stereotypes, at least on the surface, but they are very relatable Hollywood stereotypes. That needs some explaining too. You see, the game doesn't pretend that the player, who is engaged in equally mind-numbing zombie slaying, is any better than the equally vapid characters. It forces you to engage with the ridiculous caricatures of Hollywood elites, but rather than only making fun of them, you are made to empathize with them. In a game like this, that shouldn't work, but somehow, it does. The game portrays the same kind of shitty, idiotic, annoyingly vapid Hollywood stereotypes we've seen for decades. But unlike most versions of that, it puts the player on the same level and doesn't let you look down on them. You are, after all, engaging in this game, this game. It isn't exactly high art. You are mindlessly chopping apart and gunning down hordes in increasingly bombastic and bloody ways, fighting arcadey enemies while pursuing that sweet, sweet dopamine. Your character shouts one-lighters while you line up an electric acid explosion after dropkicking a zombie into the blast radius. It isn't very intellectual. And then it expects you to enter a scene filled with stereotypes of rich people and judge them? Listen, I just had the time of my life sledgehammering a burning zombie to death in order to acquire a shiny golf club. I've got no room to judge. And the player characters all seem to take the same approach. We're all weird here. Let's get along. No judgment. And we are talking about characters that would be insufferable in most games. The kind that wouldn't be making jokes. They would be the jokes. Most game, most media, tells us to look down on the shallowness of Hollywood and on the people in it. But what Dead Island does is refuse that. No, you are on the same level of shallowness that they are. Of course you are. They might be focused on things that don't matter, creating content, impressing celebrities, bygone eras, but are you any better? You just swept a zombie's leg with an electrified gardening rake. You're not. And by putting you, both the player and the character, on the same level of ridiculousness as these celebrities and their peons, the game actually, almost miraculously, manages to find a fresh perspective in its otherwise fairly standard story and gameplay. Because when you aren't looking down on their vapidity, you realize that it isn't all that vapid. That the people who you think are vapid are actually richly deep with motivations, goals, and personality. Sure, they're over the top, they're funny, but they are nuanced, and more importantly, they're written as real people. You might think I'm overstating my case, but let's look at some examples. A washed-up lead singer of a metal band greets you in purple panties and slurs every word he speaks. This is perfect fodder for a joke character, but instead, you learn facts about him before a joke is made. You learn very quickly that he has a loving relationship with his wife, that he wants to get back into music, and that he places full confidence in his daughter. All this before he makes a self-aware joke at his expense. He might make that joke, but he certainly isn't one. He is what he says he is at face value. Over the top? Maybe, but human. You aren't meant to pity him or condescend or view him as a comedic prop. He's just a funny, quirky guy, but still a person. Or take the brown-nosing secretary, Michael. Well, he is actually well-liked and hard-working in the community. He's a bit pandering, perhaps, but not an idiot. He has a slew of awards himself and genuinely helps the celebrity he works for, Emma Gaunt, and she doesn't spurn him for it, but rather values him quite highly. He takes pride in his work. He might come across as a little bit simpering, but 
he certainly comes across as a nuanced, intelligently written character as well. And about him. At some point near the beginning of the game, he runs off away from the mansion, and you have to track him down. To do so, you have to follow in the carnage that demonstrates his own capacity for destroying zombies until you finally reach him. And when you do, the game sets up a joke. As you enter the trailer he's holed up in, he tells you that he managed to secure Emma John's Ramsey Award, as though that was important. And that should be it. There's the joke. Haha, <laughs> this Hollywood kiss-up has his priorities so out of whack and is so out of touch that he thinks that an award matters in the apocalypse. And you have to rescue him for it? What an idiot. But the scene isn't played for laughs. You have this ridiculous character and you have this absurd setup, but it's played quite seriously. And the scene goes on undercutting that joke. There is a somberness to it, and Michael, the character in question, is uncomfortable and attached. He is so distant, and it is so obvious to the player what has happened, even if it isn't for your character. He's been bit. He knows that he's dying, and will become a zombie soon, and he's just trying to do what's right at the end of his life. And it really reads like that. What's more, he reveals what he actually came for. The award was only one small, sentimental part of it. He, as he steps to the side in the next sentence, he reveals that in this trailer is a gamut of medical supplies. He didn't sacrifice himself on a meaningless trip to rescue an award, itself more complicated than it first seems. He did so in order to secu secure valuable medicine to keep the survivors alive. And, like, I'm sorry, I didn't know I was signing up for nuanced portrayals of the complicated lives of Hollywood celebrities and their associates in this modern, schlocky zombie game. I should remind you that this is the game that sees you home running zombies into a fire so a content mention influencer can get it on film so she can upload it for cheap fame. Hell, the very next scene after the one with Michael sees you fighting a fat zombie dressed in a voodoo shaman costume on set who vomits bile at you in front of a gigantic, pyrotechnically enabled animatronic spider. Okay, this game may have issues with tonal consistency, but that just makes it all the more fascinating, right? Because it could have just made unrealistic comedic characters that you're meant to poke fun at and laugh at. It could have done that, and it might have even made a more consistent experience. It certainly would have been more in line with other zombie media, but instead, someone in the writer's room decided to flesh out these characters, make you care, and use them to make a point about how we judge people. Because you're supposed to take into account the stereotypes and assume that these people are vapid and shallow, and every time, they seem to prove that they're more than that. It isn't long before you're back at your home base, where you rejoin Michael. He is talking with Emma Jaunt, and, well, I already told you he's been bitten. You know what happens next. Michael, in a last act of dedication to the surprisingly warm Emma Jaunt, returns her Ramsey Award to her before dying in her arms. Emma, then, in stark contrast with the typical archetype of a stuck-up actress, defends him insists that he isn't gone, that he will get better. She cares about him, and she goes through the surprisingly human response of denial. She even points a gun at you in order to prevent you from shooting him. She genuinely cares. The scene is genuinely emotionally tense. And when you eventually have to take the gun and shoot him right before he rises again, saving Emma, she isn't thankful. And the scene isn't played as you being the big hero and rescuing her from her delusion. Instead, she is distraught. This Hollywood archetype of a stuck-up actress is genuinely devastated, and it makes for an uncomfortable but effective scene. The player character apologizes for doing what you had to do, but furious and upset, Emma Jaunt asks you to leave her mansion. As you do, you head towards the door and are stopped by another caricature, or at least somebody who should be a short, just-past-middle-aged Hispanic housekeeper. Emma's housekeeper, that is, with a thick, ac thick accent. She might as well be a carbon copy of Consuela from Family Guy, and yet she stops you and pleads with you not to leave, resolving her own character arc of mistrust and anger, and explains that Emma needs some time, but that you should stay and help, and that Emma's a good person. Like, in this game? Really? With these characters, with this premise, five minutes ago I was tossing a fuel can canister at a zombie built like 1990s Hulk Hogan while my character quipped about cutting him down to size and now I'm left with a pit in my stomach after dispatching somebody's closest friend to save them? This 
is a lot more than I signed up for. Say what you will about whiplash, but that's got to prove something about effective writing. And I don't know whether to call it incredible. I don't know that what is on display in Dead Island 2 can really be incredible without overstating its merits, but it really is something. Makes you think, doesn't it? This isn't the first time the Dead Island franchise, if it can be called that, has dabbled in being more than what it is. In fact, it's a trend that started with the very first thing we ever saw about Dead Island. It's announcement trailer, all the way back in February of 2011. Some of you might already know what I'm getting at. The trailer has a well-earned 17 million views on YouTube, but for the uninitiated, Dead Island's trailer is not only the best thing to ever come out of Dead Island, it's one of the best trailers ever released for a video game. We open on a still eyeball, and then zoom out to see that it belongs to a small girl, certainly no older than maybe 10 or 11. She's dead, her eyes frozen in perpetual fear. In the background, a zombie flails, burning. We cut back and forth between her running down a hallway, presumably chased by zombies, and then that same scene with her dead on the ground outside. And then the trailer really starts. When we cut back to the dead girl lying in the grass, we realize that time is playing in reverse as, as though carried by marionette strings, the little girl is lifted from the ground, the camera tracking her every movement. Glass cascades up around her, immediately making clear what happened. She fell from the building to her death, presumably after being chased by zombies. The remainder of the trailer synchronizes the viewpoints in one. In one, the girl is running away from the zombies, clearly on the upper floors of the hotel, and in the other, the girl is pulled in reverse slow motion up from the ground towards the upper floors of a hotel that we already know she is destined to fall out of. And a lot happens in between those two moments. Two people, presumably her parents, try to fight off zombies in a hotel room, complete with the brutal decapitations and maiming wounds that the series would become known for. The little girl, as well as her presumed father, has been bitten, and she, after turning into, into a zombie, is thrown out the window by him. The entire time, slow, droning, sad piano music is playing, only rarely intercut with the sounds of screams, cuts, and other horrors. As a piece of art itself, it borders on being a masterpiece. I mean this unironically when I say it might be the best three minutes of zombie media ever created. It's touching and sad. It uses the premise of zombies in a unique way, and it provokes this deep, empathetic response that most zombie media just fails to. And the game it was for looked like, well, this. Certainly lacking any of the emotion of that initial trailer, certainly without that flair. Dead Island, like its successor, was just a hack-and-slash looter-shooter where your main goal was kill zombies and have fun. The characters, universally, were unlikable and forgettable. No real empathy was to be had. Back then, it was a bit of a disappointment for those who loved the trailer, to say the least. One look at the comment section and you quickly become inundated with phrases like, this may be the best game trailer of all time, but if only the game itself had lived up to the hype, and other similar sentiments. Back then, Dead Island abandoned that empathy. And now, 12 years later, after one of the longest and most uncertain development roads of any game ever, Dead Island 2 finally delivers in at least some of that initial promise. It is still a hack and slash looter slasher where your main goal is to kill zombies and have fun, but I think some of that initial em empathy rubbed off from all the way back in February of 2011. Certainly, Dead Island 2 never reaches those heights. I don't know that very many games ever could hope to, but it does at least begin to fulfill that promise. It takes this ridiculous world with these ridiculous characters who would be scorned in pretty much any other game as satirical as this one, and then it makes you care for them, to take interest in them. We are shown that they are more than the hollow, Hollywood-pruned versions of themselves they present at first, but that they are actually human beneath that. Rather than look down at them, the game asks us to take them at face value, as people whose weird idiosyncrasies are what makes them worthy of empathy, rather than worthy of ridicule. Dead Island 1 promised, all those years ago, an emotional, empathetic betrayal of a zombie apocalypse, and gave us a by-the-numbers looter slasher with none of the heart of that first masterpiece trailer. Dead Island 2, however, flips that. It has promised to be nothing more than a by-the-numbers looter slasher aside, maybe one that happens to have a dozen years of polish and thought behind it, but 
what it delivers is that as well as an emotional empathetic portrayal of a zombie apocalypse not in the same way as that first trailer but in a way that might just be more relevant right now not to mention more tonally consistent with the series in a world where we are so constantly judging each other criticizing each other and viewing so many others as vapid or idiotic dead island 2 takes the unconventional route towards empathy by putting you the player on the same level as those who would normally be judged and then it forces you to empathize with them, to see that they are more than what they've been made out to be. And regardless of anything else, I just think that's kind of great. I guess that just leaves me with one final question. Why is it called Dead Island if it's now set in LA? LA is in California, and it is not set in an island off the coast of California. No, it's set in LA. It is set in, sorry, Hell A, which is itself either genius or idiotic but like it's called dead island dead island 2 but like the first one took place on a paradise island it took place on an island this one takes place in a city on the coast yes but not an island why is it called dead island 2 if it's not on an island i don't even think you go to an island at any point during the game i can't remember a time when you do so like why would you call it dead island if you don't have an island like there isn't even island vibes. There's California vibes, but California is not an island. California is California. L.A. is L.A. What I'm getting at here is very important, and it is that I demand an island in Dead Island 3. Thank you very much. This has been Graves from Game Banshee. Goodbye.